Hi, welcome to the Health Essentials Podcast brought to you by Cleveland Clinic. I'm your host, Nada Youssef. As 2020 continues with COVID-19 and its associated precautions like social distancing, masks, and hand hygiene, distance learning is moving towards classroom or in-person learning, again, as schools reopen. However, as kids head back to the classroom, new or pre-existing anxiety or other learning differences may affect their comfort and abilities at school. Here to help us navigate the situation is Dr. Ethan Benoor. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Dr. Benoor is a pediatric pain management psychologist. He currently serves as center head for Cleveland Clinic Children's Center for Pediatric Behavioral Health. And to our listeners, please remember this is for informational purposes only, and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice. Also, please note that this interview was pre-recorded and does not reflect any changes to COVID-19 precautions that may have taken place after this recording. So I'd like to start by talking about school reopenings and all the stress and anxiety that's coming with it. So schools have been opening slowly, moving from virtual to hybrid to in-person learning. And going back to the classroom amid this pandemic uh, causes a, a lot of new heightened anxiety in some kids. Um, is there anything we can do for our kids to prepare them for in-school learning so we might ease it before it even starts? I think so. Um, so there's a couple of things that will be helpful. Um, one thing that we know is that providing information, appropriate, age-appropriate information and not overwhelming kids, but appropriate information can help reduce anxiety. So let them know what it's going to look like. What are the changes going to be? Um, not in a scary way, but in, in a matter-of-fact way. They're going to be doing temperature checks. People are going to be wearing masks. You may have some scheduled seating. Things are going to look a little bit different. Um, beyond that, um, it's important to let them know that they're safe, um, that we're doing these things to help manage some safety. Um, and that is, one, it's a good thing, and two, that they are safe to go to school. Um, following these recommendations, the goal is to try to educate kids, um, to try to um, encourage um, appropriate social interactions, and at the same time, um, try to mitigate or reduce the spread of COVID. And so um, we're doing two things that are important. Um, we're educating our kids and getting them back to school and being safe and responsible citizens uh, to try to reduce um, COVID. And I think it's important that kids feel that they are part of that, a part of that process um, of helping society fight COVID. Um, I think the other thing that's important to let kids know is what to do if you have concerns. Ask, um, ask me, ask your teachers, um, but please reach out because we, we want people to continue to feel safe and comfortable going to school so that you can learn. Great, and one thing you did mention with uh, wearing masks, you know, going back and seeing that everybody's wearing masks, their teachers, their friends, everybody, how do we explain to them the safety precautions of how to wear masks? Because we know kids fiddle with their face, and I know my kids are always touching their mask. How do you explain to them the effective way of wearing a mask without scaring them, you know, that the virus will come through if you don't, you know, uh, if you don't handle it properly? Yeah, so, I, I mean, your, your point there is really good that, we don't, the whole point about wearing a mask is not to scare people. The, the point is to try to um, prevent COVID or prevent spread of a potential, potential spread of a virus, a virus that either you may have or somebody else may have. And so in the same way that we teach kids how to wash hands, that we teach kids um, how to hold hands before crossing the street, um, this is, there's a safe way of crossing the street. And so it's not running across the street without looking. Um, there's, a, there's a safe way to go to school now, and this is what it looks like. And then walk them through the steps. Um, there's some great um, videos on hand washing. There's some great videos on, on how to wear a mask. The importance of not touching it too much. Um, I think it's important not to be punitive about it. Um, again, you know, if you stay mindful of kind of the goal of, of feeling um, safe, um, and yet uh, a part of this larger process to prevent COVID, I think that's a much better approach than um, your child is either doing a good or bad thing by touching the mask. Um, this is hard. It's hard for all of us. Um, so uh, keep that in mind when you're also talking to your child. I think it's hard for all of us to wear a mask for 30 minutes, let alone you know six hours during a school day. 
Yeah, but they're happy to wear it so they can get back to their friends and their school and outdoors. They're definitely excited to be back. Um, can you talk a little bit about anxiety and how it might show up for our kids and how parents and educators can help? Sure. So, you know, I, I think um, anxiety, depression, um, stress, uh, that's important to keep a lookout um, right now. There's a lot going on and, and some kids might not be so um, overt or out in the open about their symptoms. And so you might notice that your child is more sullen, staying to themselves more. Um, you might notice that your child is, is more irritable um, and you might be more irritable and sullen yourself, but, um, but pay attention to any behavior changes, um, uh, especially the, the kind of removing themselves um, from other activities or from social engagements. Um, the other is um, sleep difficulties. Um, and then a, a lot of kids, um, younger kids and older kids, um, have uh, physical complaints. So stomach aches and headaches are common. Um, and so use any observation that you have about your child's behavior or about an ache or pain that they notice as, as a jumping off point for a conversation. How, how are you doing uh, right now? How are you doing in this situation? Um, how are you feeling and what are you thinking? And so um, use any observation that you have to start the conversation about just checking in on their mental health. That's a, that's a great point. And in the past, you know, three, four months, I've literally seen my kids grow and there's a lot of changed behavior being with them 10 hours extra a day or so. And um, so I wanted to talk, because uh, I think it's very important to pinpoint change behavior as kids are literally growing in front of our eyes versus something is wrong. And you mentioned isolation, uh, sleep, sleeping patterns. Is there anything else to pinpoint that could be different than normal grown pains? The, the big ones that I would take a look at, um, I, the big ones I would take a look at would be um, sleep, irritability, um, and complaints of pain. Um, sullenness or kind of um, uh, um, um, avoiding others. I, I think those are the biggest, but you know, in, in, in all honesty, I, I think the key uh, for parents right now um, is going to be to, to step up. Um, we, we do have more time with our children now, maybe more than we, more than we expected. I don't know if it's more than we wanted, but um, it, it's a great opportunity to start having these conversations with your child. Um, if, if you're having these conversations regularly, it doesn't feel so weird um, when there is a problem. And so if, if you have a thought or a concern, ask, bring it up. If it's nothing, that's okay. Um, but your child might feel even more comfortable if they come back to you two weeks later and there is something there. Sure. Now, is there any way that, you know, this anxiety irritability could be so extreme that it's interfering in school? And how, how do you think that we should know as parents, you know, and, and another question to that, because as a parent, you want to talk to the teacher and you want to ask them about your child, but you don't, you know, they're already under a lot of stress. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody's communicating. There's so many problems with technology happening now. How do I know if my child is affected in school? Yeah, that, so uh, and it's a good point. Um, and, you know, I, I would go back to communication is, is most likely the answer. Um, in terms of children struggling in school, struggling in school can be um, a symptom of uh, emotional distress. In this situation, it actually might be a cause of distress as well. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that I'm hearing is um, lesson plans that, that aren't getting um, introduced effectively because of um, what the schools are going through with technology, um, the, a lot of uh, downtime in school. So there's some boredom that also stresses kids out. Um, and then, you know, not establishing a clear supportive relationship with the teacher, whether it's the masks or whether it's some of the online work. And so feeling like I don't really don't know who to go to for help. Um, I, I think having those conversations with your child um, to identify whether it's, it's mental health or whether it's academic mm -hmm. um, issues are important so that you can problem solve. I think having conversations with the teacher is important. Um, one thing that I would recommend for parents um, is um, be compassionate. Be compassionate when you talk to your child if they're not getting the grades that they got last year. This is not last year. This is different. This is a 
different year we're going through. Be compassionate with the teacher. You may have two, three, four children at home. Your teacher may have 20 or 30 kids, um, or they may have multiple uh, children that they really only see uh, for 90 minutes, two, three times a week. Um, and so everybody is struggling a little bit. I think if we can um, check in with each other um, and really you know, prioritize what the issues are, the issues that could make my life easier right now is if my child understood her algebra homework. And so have the conversation with the teacher about that. But, but be compassionate about it. I think that will reduce some of the defensiveness and, and everybody will help each other a little bit more. Great. Now with kids going back uh, in-person schooling with the coronavirus precautions, we're seeing that schools are sending kids home more often with things like stomach aches and headaches. Um, for kids who have anxiety that manifest as pain, um, how can we tell if that symptoms is a sign of anxiety versus something like COVID-19? So, um, you know, there are some specific um, symptoms for COVID-19 to check. And if, and if you are concerned, whether it's been exposure or whether it's been the, the COVID-19 symptoms that you present with or the symptoms that you present with, um, the school will definitely help in terms of assisting you for assessing whether or not it is COVID-19. Now, schools are got, have gotten very good at this, and they've gotten pretty good at communicating um, what they're doing in this regard. Um, I would also encourage parents to stay in touch with their primary care provider. Um, if you need to get tested for COVID-19, you get tested for COVID-19. Um, but much of, the, um, much of the safety guards that are in place, the same ones that we use here at the hospital, um, are meant to protect people um, because we don't know everybody who has COVID-19 and those who don't. And so the idea of everybody washing their hands, of everybody wearing a face mask, of trying to maintain social distancing is, is the best behaviors that we can do to mitigate or to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, but if you have those kind of somatic um, questions or, or questions about um, stomach pains, headaches, um, talk to the primary care provider. Uh, that's a good point. So as a parent, what should we uh, look for? Let's say, you know, last year, my daughter has a fever, I would not send her sc to school or if she threw up something like that. Now, if a kid shows up or wakes up, I'm sorry, with aches, pains, um, coughing, is that something that I should keep my kid home or should I send them to school and have them do their own precaution testing? Yeah, so it's a good question. And, and what I would recommend actually is um, every school has posted um, their, their rules for, for school attendance. So I think it's important to check with your local school district um, in terms of what the steps are if your child wakes up with a fever. Um, it may be really just, just the amount of fever that says whether or not they're comfortable bringing the child to school. It may be fever with some other symptoms. But check with your local school district. Um, and if you have concerns, uh, even the morning up, go ahead and give them a call. Um, again, we're, we're all doing the best that we can to try to mitigate the spread. And if you feel more comfortable double checking with your school prior to bringing your child in, I, I, think, I think you're being a good citizen there. <laughs> now for kids who have been more isolated at home over the spring and the summer seasons without you know, many people or outside interactions, is there anything we could do as parents to ease their transition back to school where they're all of a sudden surrounded by a lot of people? <laughs> That, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I think, I think some kids um, are desperate to see uh, other individuals and get, and get back into some semblance of, of normalcy. Uh, I think for other kids, whether they're, they're socially shy, anxious, whether this might be a, a new school year or a new school, um, uh, it, it can be a bit overwhelming uh, to go from zero to 60. Um, and so uh, it's the same concept of um, give them a plan, reassure them that they're safe, and kind of walk through the strategies of how they're going to um, get through the school day. Um, the other thing I think that's important is um, take it in bite-sized fashion. And so if your child is feeling anxious or scared, just make it through the day. Just make it through the morning, figure out how your child is going to get through a, a shorter uh, portion of the day, not the entire week. Um, once your child feels successful, I made it through my first two periods, I made it through my first day, 
that, that self-efficacy or that sense of confidence will help ease some of the anxieties for either the rest of the day or the rest of the week. Now, I want to talk about uh, learning differences uh, with kids, because um, kids with learning differences like, you know, um, ADD, autism spectrum disorder, or sensory processing disorders may have a challenging transition from virtual to classroom learning. Can you explain what these differences are and what kids might experience? This is actually an excellent question. Um, you know, it sometimes feels, I think, that we're trying to have one solution um, to help all children. And, and not all children are the same and not all children learn the same. Um, also, um, there's a lot of kids that are on um, IEPs, individualized education plans, or have certain accommodations in school. Um, some of those may be relatively easy to continue in this school year. Some of those may be different uh, or difficult to do. I think it's very important um, if you have a child on an individualized education plan, check in with the school, check in with the school regularly, um, at least periodically, um, to see how your child is doing, how the plan is being rolled out. Um, and, and above all, I think, you know, what you can do as a parent um, to jump in. Um, again, we are going to have to prioritize some things this year. I think keeping um, children, schools, um, safe is one. Um, addressing um, the, the mental health, kind of reducing uh, the level of, of panic that we're feeling right now is going to be important. And also um, addressing their academic growth. And so, you know, we've got three things to work on now. Um, kids are very resilient. Um, I think that's important. I'm not, not saying that, that we should not address certain things, but, but I hope that that gives people some comfort that even though it's difficult, um, for the most part, kids are resilient and, and, and you'd be surprised what they learn and grow from this experience. Um, so it's okay if you need to prioritize some things. It's okay if, um, and it might actually be important for you or somebody else um, to jump in and get creative in terms of meeting some of the educational needs that your child has to make it through this year. Great. Now, is it possible that coming back to school after such a long time, not being in a classroom could expose a learning uh, difference or disability that was maybe unknown before? It, you know what? It's a really good point. I, I, my first thought is no. Um, and I, I honestly, um, I think it's because there's so much else going on. Um, so if you do have a concern, I would really highlight it. I would pay attention to it because um, a lot of um, kids go with undiagnosed uh, or underdiagnosed learning difficulties. And I do think this is one of those years where there's so much that's going on um, that a learning difficulty might go unnoticed. And so if you do have a concern, um, please raise it, please monitor your child and please raise it to make sure that it doesn't go un under assessed or addressed. There are some situations where um, a child's anxiety or mood uh, might present um, as, as an additional uh, barrier to going to school um, or attending class. And um, I think this is a tricky situation, especially when it presents with um, physical complaints. Um, and there's a lot of concern right now for individuals being sick. Um, schools may, may prefer just to send children home if they're concerned about um, physical complaints, stomach aches, headaches, um, maybe fatigue. I, I think um, if the parent knows that this is um, more on the mental health side, more anxiety, um, it's very important to have a conversation with the school. Um, just like with um, ADHD, autism, um, other learning disabilities, it's important to have a, a plan for how that child's um, emotional health is going to be addressed so that the child can participate to the best of their ability in school. That might mean um, that a child is not being sent home if they're having physical complaints, um, unless there are certain criteria that are met. That might mean that the school and, uh, and the parents identify a, a different approach um, to educating the child um, currently than what are being um, than what's happening with other students in the classroom. 
Um, I think it's important to address mental health issues. Uh, I think it's important to try to include children as much as possible um, for social purposes and what's happening with the rest of the class. Um, but um, if physical complaints or physical reports are really just manifesting uh, emotional distress or emotional difficulties in children, I think just like other um, academic or educational concerns, um, the school and the parents need to talk about that and have an individualized plan for how they're going to address it. And how, um, how would you say that we should be advocating for these students right now? I think the best way to advocate uh, for the students right now is uh, establishing uh, a, a coalition or collaboration with their teachers. You know, teachers are having a, a rough time right now, too. Um, this, this is not easy for them. Your work is not easy for you. Um, and their work is not easy for them right now, too. And, and some schools are actually, you know, adjusting um, based on uh, the levels of cases in the community. And so um, it, it's, it's quite a period of stress and transition for everybody, your teachers included. Um, form a coalition with your teachers to really um, work as a team to identify um, or monitor how your child is doing, identify any difficulties, and then work together um, to respond. Uh, I think teachers would feel very grateful um, to know that they have uh, a parent in their corner um, and would feel very motivated um, to help a child when they have support uh, from the parents to help that child. I agree with what you said because the parents can help the teachers and the teachers can help the parents yes. and, and that would be excellent. Now I do want to switch to parents health right now and uh, the anxiety that uh, the parents are affected by. So parental anxiety is very real right now with balancing from schools to jobs, homework, technology challenges. How do we prioritize? <laughs> so it's a very, it's a very good um, point. You know, um, prioritizing is one of the things that we talk about in psychological first aid, that it's okay and it's important to do. Um, you know, prioritizing, I, I'm not going to set the priorities for you, but, but I am going to give parents permission to prioritize. Um, you might need um, to take care of, of one child who's really struggling. You might need to um, focus on your job so that you maintain your job, maintain your benefits. You may need to pull back from your job to focus on your family, because you guys are, are going after each other um, and really need to create some space and create some fun and kind of bring back the love. Um, but I think it's important to sit down and, and prioritize that. Um, how to do it, um, I, would have, I would have the parents um, sit down together, um, whether it's uh, one parent, you know, get some other adults um, to get some input, um, two parents, multiple households, um, have the adults sit down and kind of write down what they think the priorities are so that we're um, sure that the kids are being um, considered in that and talk to the kids about what the priorities are. I, I think it's important that kids um, understand, again, at their level um, so that they know what they need to focus on, um, what they should be thinking about and what they don't need to worry about because mom or dad or aunt or uncle are kind of taking care of that part. Now, our children are like sponges, and you know, as a parent, my stress levels can affect my kids' mood um, and their own stress levels. Uh, balancing our own work, kids' schooling, uh, and everything in between, we keep hearing the term, we're in this together, but what do you say to the parents having trouble dealing with their own stress, um, yeah. with these life changes, maybe feeling alone before helping you know, a child? It's difficult. Um, it's, it's difficult when you feel alone. When you feel alone, reach out. Re reach out to whomever um, can be there to help you. There are a number of resources out there. Um, if you don't have a family member, if you don't have a friend, if you don't have a neighbor that you can reach out to, reach out to some resources. Um, there, there are very good resources through um, the Ohio Department of Health, um, through your local county. Um, but take care of yourself. It's important so that you can take care of your child. Um, we, we are in this together. I mean, we, we say that because it, it helps um, to deal with this. But one of the other things that I, I tell parents, you know, one, take care of yourself so that you can help your child. But, but two, this is actually an opportunity for you to work on um, mental health, mental wellness, physical health, physical wellness as a family. You guys all probably need to get off the couch and do some exercise. So go take a walk together. 
Um, you're not getting a lot of social attention from other individuals right now. So play some games together. Um, get creative, um, but, but address all of those things from nutrition to sleep to exercise to social engagement um, so that you guys are, are filling yourself up with the resources that you need to manage what is a really stressful time for everyone. I agree. And I love the silver lining, Dr. Benor. That was great. And thank you so much for, for everything. Thank you for being here today. And if you would like to schedule an appointment with Cleveland Clinic Children's Behavioral Health Specialists, please call 216-448-6110. And for more podcasts like today's experts or more, you can visit clevelandclinic.org slash HE podcast or subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your own podcast. And for more health tips, news, and information, follow us at Cleveland Clinic on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time.